Ours is the Fury, and this is Nerdwatch. I, I pledge you my life and honor to tonight's watch for this night and all the nights to come. Hey guys, this is Josiah Baratheon, and as always with me... The Night King Cometh Austin. The Night King Cometh Austin. Sweet. <laughs> so, as before, this is the Nerd Watch, so I hope you guys are excited uh, for one more week of Game of Thrones down the hatch of the only, like, what, six episodes now, I believe? Yeah. Yeah, so, that's all we got. Man, six episodes, and we're already down two, and they were all just, like, kind of, like, uh, setting the scene for the final episodes. So, Austin, let's go straight yeah. into it. What was your feels about this episode? Um, I'm going to say this, and I know that we've talked about this before, and it was very heavily used this week on Game of Thrones, and that is the old story-making tool called resolution mm -hmm. it's was very apparent that this was resolution this whole episode people were getting a good ending and they were setting up for those characters deaths and i hope i really really hope that they kind of twist us a little bit and don't really per se go with every single character death that we think of um but this episode really set up a lot of things it did some things to some characters mm -hmm. that have pushed their storylines a little bit further um there was a lot of humor uh the episode overall was a great rounded episode but if you're watching it to like get this whole fight Thing with the Night King and everything going on, um, you're going to be very disappointed. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of, kind, of, kind of a tease, this whole episode and the last one. Yeah, so, like, they're kind of setting up, and hopefully, you know, the next episode is the episode that everyone's been wanting. Mm -hmm. I just read today that this episode actually is an hour and a half long now. Cool. Um, so, that's what I just read. I don't know. I can't confirm. I haven't like looked into it too much, but like what I was told is this is going to be one of the most action-packed episodes of Game of Thrones, and I'm super excited for this week coming up. Like I, I can't wait to see this new episode. But let's not completely overshadow next episodes with this week's episode. That was really good. It set up a lot of the good things. Mm -hmm. We got to see some feelings from other people that we haven't seen a lot. And uh, a lot of cool interactions happened. I mean, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, this episode, uh, I've always been a fan of, like, resolution arcs. And, like, we watched it with my friend Blake, <clears throat> who is also a big, like, anime person. And he mentioned how in a lot of anime, and just honestly, it's, it's in storytelling writings naturally, um, that when resolutions occur, it's the symbol of the end of someone's arc. Um and we saw a lot of that, like from Brienne to Jamie to Theon, like just a lot of resolutions. And I think that's going to de definitely set up for a lot of possibilities. But we'll get in that once we get into the breakdown itself. So now that we got that feeling, and by the way, I, I will say, I, I didn't really say it, but um, I love this episode. I liked it a lot. I talked to a couple of my um, coworkers and they're like, oh, we didn't really like this episode and everything. I'm like, well... You don't like storytelling. You like different things for different reasons. But that's neither here nor there. So let's go ahead and go down on the breakdown below. Austin, to start off the episode, we opened up on the pan of mm -hmm. Jamie and Winterfell in front of uh, Sansa, John, and Daenerys. Take us through exactly what happened there. So, if you don't really know anything about these characters, this is a very, very, very heavy scene that uh, didn't disappoint, though, in my opinion. I really like this episode that brings the whole Jamie aspect. So, you know, let's take, for example, Bran. Uh, Jamie threw him out of a window the last time he saw him in, in Winterfell and made him paralyzed. Uh, but 
you know, we'll talk about Bran a little bit later with Jamie. Uh, Daenerys, uh, her father was murdered by Jamie, mm-hmm. stabbed in the back, and his throat slipped. And Sansa Stark, that Jamie betrayed their family and, like, kind of hmm. made Ned Stark go to prison in a way. <laughs> well, he, he attacked so, Ned on the streets and killed their uh, master of arms, I believe it was at the time. Yeah, yeah that's right. I remember because uh, it was like in a little hut. I remember that scene in the first season. So, you know, there's a lot of things that these characters are very upset about. Um, so, you know, and also too is, you know, Jamie opens up with saying, you know, Cersei lied. You know, she's not saying her army and it kind of made Tyrion look like a fool. <laughs> and that's that's the thing Cersei's good at. Cersei's, you know, and they even talk later in the episode, her, uh, you know, Tyrion and Jamie saying, like, you know, we were fools, you know, yeah. <laughs> for, you know, we know how she is and we, we can't believe that we went through it. But you could tell that most of the characters here were very upset that he was even near Winterfell. Uh, but Jamie kind of stood clear and was like, look, I'm for the army of the living room. I mean, living. <laughs> I, I'm not, f- you know, I'm, I'm not for Lannisters right now. I'm for the living. And so that speaks a lot of volumes, but it didn't speak a lot of volumes until the one person that I think that's in love with Jamie Lannister is a brain of Tarth has stood up and was like, look, you know, uh, Jamie is a very honorable man. If it wasn't for what he did and lost his hand over it, I w- these guys would have had my way. These Boltons would have had my way uh, with me. But he stood up and he sacrificed. And Jamie's a good guy, you know. And I, I believe Jamie's a progressively good character mm-hmm. over time, from time to time. Yeah. You know, I think Cersei really warps him, but I think now we're seeing. Jamie become the real Jamie that Jamie should be. So overall, um, Daenerys and Sansa's like, you know, we agree. You know, Brienne of Tarth has really helped everyone here. So that means, you know, she she's very loyal to the cause and very loyal. And John even said, you know, we need every man we can get, mm-hmm. which I think that's John's every answer now but i liked i liked that scene so much that you know i I was waiting for them to have that conclusion because those characters haven't been around for so long and we've been seeing a lot of that lately with the new uh the first two episodes yeah so it was a very good scene yep i agree um yeah like when brianne stood up i was finally like i was so happy to finally see her (laughs) I was wondering when she was going to even appear, um, which she is base like Jamie is basically the main character for this episode, um, and Brienne is either a hot second or even first in place, honestly. And I think it's it, it was just a great episode because one, I Brienne's one of my my favorite female character by far, um, and Jamie and Brienne, I just have I just love that combo together. And is she in love with Jamie? Yeah, I think I think she kind of is in love with Jamie, but I don't know like if she's like in romantic love. I don't know. I, 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 who knows? Who knows? So it'll, ha- it'll show off during the end. Um, so after that, they let Jamie stay and join the army of the living or Winterfell, um, and then we're kind of treated to a couple scenes with Jamie and kind of rebringing people back together. Uh, Jamie and uh, Bran got to have their little conversation in the God's Wood. Um, which, side note, before we go into it, um, I love the reference um, that Bran makes to Jamie in the conference room when he's like, the things we do for love. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it has to be like kind of dramatize, uh, traumatizing, you know, if you think about it, that this kid, that's what he hears before he lost his ability to walk. And may- well, hmm. I think I think the best part of that whole scene is when he says it. Jamie Lannister's face, yeah, is perfect. Yep. There's there's so. a lot of that in this episode. I feel is just the reaction shots are just on point. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But anyways, uh, Bran, 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 and Jamie uh, have themselves a little talk in the God's Wood. Basically, Jamie just kind of apologizing to Bran, and Bran saying like, "It's fine. If you didn't do that, you wouldn't. You would be. You wouldn't be the man you are today." And so when Bran, Bran, I keep saying Bran, but Bran, and that is like I, I think that's ultimately important and it's very interesting whenever uh they I, I think it's very interesting that whenever he like talks to him he says that he's not Bran um and I wonder if that means like he's he's either accepted the mantle as three eye raven and he knows he can never be Bran or if like this is actually the three eye raven in Bran's body probably won't have any type of connection or truth to that but I don't know. It was an interesting thought process. Um, we also saw Jamie and Tyrion. You even mentioned to it a little bit with uh, them talking about how, like, uh, Jamie's like, "Oh, you know, Cersei. Cersei's great at manipulating and telling lies, um, using the truth to tell lies." And um, Tyrion's like, "Yeah, she she's good at manipulating people." And he's like, "It's like, yeah, but she never manipulated you." Or you, you knew exactly what she was. It was something like to that accord. Um, hmm. But it was a great, like, kind of relationship uh, talk. Like, they used to have back in season one when they were around each other a lot. And it's kind of cool to see their character progression from what they were to what they are now. And, and just their, their thought processes and how much they've, they're different, but they talk the same. Um, mm -hmm. And then one of my scenes that I really liked was when Jamie went out and talked with Brienne in the field. And ultimately, like, they saw Podrick uh, fighting away. And it was just really cool to see him um, actually be, like, competent whenever he's fighting. Like, he was, like, causing that kid to fight back and pulling them off. Like, it was kind of cool. And I, I see good things coming from Podrick or a death, one of those two. It, it could be either. <laughs> and... Basically, it was just a scene of Jamie just explaining to Brienne that it's like, hey, um, I'm not going to be a great leader like I was. You know, I'm not the soldier I used to be. Um, I'm kind of bad, but I would like to fight under you, like be commanded by you. And I thought that was a big thing for Jamie because, you know, since he became a knight, he basically leads armies. He hasn't been led for a while. And so this is a character progression thing, I feel, for him. Um, definitely something um, I look forward to. I think it's going to have some type of big impact in the next episode. So, Austin, after that, well, after the whole thing with Danny in the trial room, she's pretty upset with Tyrion. And Tyrion has a friend, honestly, kind of like a friend out of left field, I'd say. So you can go ahead and talk mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, I was kind of I was kind of shocked about this. Uh, but before we go any further, I actually want to agree with you on the Podrick thing. Um, he's very cocky. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt with his sword fighting. Uh, but beside that, let's move forward. Uh, it, it, but in my opinion, I feel like that means a character death's coming. <laughs> Someone gets a little hole ahead of themselves and ends up dying. Uh, but that's what Podrick wanted. Podrick wanted to be that cool little dude so he he's he's a he's a good man good heart so we'll see what happens but what i was saying about um so danny's very upset because you know you know Tyrion was wrong about cersei even though he pled to the north you know listen the lannisters will come they will send their army and we will fight together and clearly that's not happening they send yeah. jamie <laughs> you know they didn't even and, send jamie well, jamie went on his own accord yeah, so that's what I mean. Kind of Jamie just went on his own accord, the only Lannister that showed up. So with that being said, um, Daenerys is very upset, and she talks about it with Jormon, and Jormon's like, look, um, I think you're a little hard on Tyrion, which is a shocker for her because, you know, at the time when she made Tyrion the hand of the queen, you know, Jorm Jormon was going through Grayscale. You know, he was trying to find the cure for Grayscale at the Citadel with Sam and all them. Mm -hmm. And he comes back and 
Tyrion Lannister, the person that he brought to Daenerys, is the hand of the queen. But it was just, it was really weird to see Jorah be like, you should take it easy on him. He's an intelligent guy. He's good at what he does. If it wasn't for his thinking, we wouldn't be here. And I think you should, you know, be light on him. And she's, like, kind of shocked that, like, you know, it, it, we're all shocked that he would say something like that. But I think he realizes, and and this is why that character is so good, is he knows that he's doing good in his own position. And people make mistakes. And I think he's realizing that because he's made those mistakes before. You know, the biggest reveal... Well, the biggest thing we knew about, but Daenerys didn't know about, was when he was actually paid by Robert Baratheon to kill her, you know, have information against her, and then, you know, in the end, killing her, but he ended up falling in love with her in reality, so Jorah kind of, you know, he, he he's realized what he has to do, and I think Jorah is just happy just to be with Daenerys, and he wants to help her in her conquest or her rule. Yeah. And uh, I think that he knows that, you know, Tyrion is a better fit to be a hand for the queen. So that's what I think. But that's what really happens. So she kind of lays off a Tyrion a while, and Tyrion's kind of shocked a little bit because she shows some mercy to him. Yeah. And, and that part where Jorah <laughs> puts the camera over Jorah, there's a reaction shot where it's like, hmm, you know... <laughs> I helped you here. Ooh, like, you know, <laughs> you ever seen like those little cartoons where like, you know, the little kid, you know, is bashful and like, like kicking his like feet in the sand. He's like, Oh, you know, you know, oh, yeah. I kind of felt like that's how, uh, Jorah Mormon <laughs> was like, he was, he was, uh, he kind of felt that way. But, um, I don't know if I should go any further with some things that, uh, about Jorah Mormon, but, uh, let's, let's, uh, Let's move forward. I know, why don't you talk us through, there's a part where Danny approaches Sansa. Yeah, which was probably, I would say, second favorite scene of the, the night. The end mm-hmm. of the Danny and Jorah scene is Jorah saying, like, one more thing, and then kind of cuts. Um, so we don't really see what he talks about. There, I think there's two things that he could have possibly talked about, was either one, having Tyrion in the crypts, during the uh, during the next episode, because like originally he was like, "Oh, I'm going to fight," and she's like, "No, you go down the crypts. You'll be fine." Um, and then the other thing, well, I kind of think is what he actually talked about was Danny, like connecting with Sansa, and we we definitely see that uh, they get to have a little bit of a girls' talk, and it's it was a cool scene because you definitely got to see them like warm up to each other and start talking. And then it just started going down south the second that uh, they start talking about after the war with the dead. And Sansa's like, what about the north? We vowed never to be served by a uh, another king ever again. And Sansa basically just, like, divide them instantly amongst it. And before that, they were just talking about, like, joking about uh, how they gotten really good at uh, leading people who wouldn't accept rules from women. And showing that women are just just as, if not more capable of ruling. And that's definitely something that they both kind of connect on. Um, but then, you know, Sansa says what she says. And it basically, like, ends the yay, we're friends, to becoming, like, this middle ground coldness um, that Daenerys is definitely not going to want to give up the North. Um, and she wants, like, the whole Seven Kingdoms. She doesn't just want the south or anything like that she wants the whole thing um but luckily enough their uh, scene is ended by um a little friend coming in and I'll, I'll just instantly transition into it um theon comes back from collecting his sister and asks to serve and protect winterfell almost like an atonement for him like sacking um in season two and like f- like basically ruining the north and putting the North in such a bad state that the Boltons could take over. And it was a really touching scene. It had me tearing up because 
I, I think it was just like when Sansa started tearing up, she's such a character that's so hard right now that it just caught me off guard. And I started kind of like tearing up. And I'm like, this sucks. Like, I hate whenever I get teared up. But it was honestly a very heartfelt scene um, <laughs> with Theon going. And who knows? Probably Theon's going to be Azora Hyde. Who knows? Um, I make the joke, but the this episode really set up mm -hmm. um, multiple characters to take the place of Azora Hyde, in my opinion. Uh, but after that, after that little heartfelt thing, uh, yeah, we yeah. get a nice scene, which is probably... It was a good scene, and we got a lot of information from it. But we got to see a war room scene between eh, all the friends. Be before we go any further, so you know, I know that you talked about, you know, a little choking up on that scene where, like, you know, Sansa hugs Theon. Um, I don't know if we should go any further with this, but I, I really want to touch a point on this one because this one really choked me up. Uh, and it was the scene with Jorah. And um, Lady Mormont. Mm, Leon, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, that was one of the biggest scenes because, one, Sam shows up and it was like, Mr. Jormon, you know, uh, you know, I, I want to give you the sword of the Tallies, you know, and he's like, what? And he's like, your father, I think, is, you know, he's like, your father made me the man who I am and it would be my honor to give you the sword and he's like because i can't wield it <laughs> you know kind of like he's like you know this is a better in your hands mm -hmm. and i i choked up when i saw you know sam give him the sword and watching him like embrace that he was just so happy that he's like you know which also is another thing resolution we talk about all the time this was a big thing you know, if, if it's exactly what we think it is, it could lead to a character's death. Um, the other thing is when Lady Mormont talks to him, oh, my gosh, you know, it it it, it, it crushed me. Like, it, it didn't crush me, but it was a happy crush where, like, she was, like, you know, he was proud of her. And he's, like, I'm proud of you and, like, you know, what you became and the house has became. And since, you know, my my brother, is it brother? I think it's brother, right? Jorah Mormon, mm -hmm. and then it was the, the bear it, from his brother, the, Nor the, yeah. the Night's Watch, which was his dad. Yeah, yeah. So you know they, the, both of them left Mormon house, and she's such a young age, where you know she kind of, you know, had to take over, and you can tell that he was very satisfied of how she grew up, and became with the house. So that was one of the best scenes to me. I think that's one of my favorite interactions that I've seen this season was uh, Jorah Mormon mm -hmm. and, and Jorah and uh, Lady Mormont. So, but yeah, let's move forward with the war room scene. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm, I'm going to say this. So I loved, I, 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 we don't usually get to do this. So the listeners out there, they get to hear this. Me and Josiah live kind of, you know, he lives in Pittsburgh and I live in Ohio and this week was a blessing because he got to come and me and Blake and Josiah got to watch an episode of Game of Thrones together. And, oh my gosh. Um, the war room scene is just showing that there is way more undead than what we were thinking. Um, you know, because they were like, they're, you know, the Night King's going to crush us. But they also have a plan where they talk about, hey, you know, what if we just take out the Night King, you know, and before the forces, like, kill everyone? And it looks like Winterfeld has some things planned. I've seen a couple things where I've seen uh, dragon glass on the side of the castle. Yeah, I saw that too. Kind of shoved in those. Uh, I've also seen, like, there's a pit full of fire that they're probably going to release. Um also, too, is some of the trailers I've seen is I've seen the Unsali and Grey Worm getting ready for battle out on the field, uh, which is going to be brutal because <laughs> Grey Worm's such a cool character. Um, but also, too, is I think the biggest thing was, and, and uh, Game of Thrones is so guilty of this, but this week they finally did something correctly. And you actually brought that up when we were watching it was uh, Bran Stark was like, 
well, no, why don't you just keep me at Godwood? You know, he's coming for me. And I'll never forget this because it was the funniest thing. But Sam Tarley is like, what do you mean? And you stated, you just go, good on you, Sam. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's so frustrating that, like, he says things yeah. and then no one questions him. They just look at him awkwardly. And Sam's the only smart person who turns to him and is like, wait, why is that? <laughs> yeah, Game of Thrones is really guilty of that. Like, where it doesn't really want to explain stuff, beats around the bush. Well, it's time to start explaining stuff instead of drawing things out. And so now we know that Bran Stark is connected to the Night King because Bran Stark is the memory of the world. And the Night King is here to destroy that memory. Um, so he, we know that the mark that is on Bran that the Night King has touched in the little dream that happened in season five, uh, it pretty much marks him where the Night King knows exactly where Bran yeah, is. Yeah, just when it comes so. to the war room itself, uh, it was a very awesome scene because you just got to see everyone's kind of perspective. And Bran did the one thing where Whoa. he gave himself plot armor by saying, like, hey, you know, I have to, if I die... This is the Night King's uh, goal is to kill me and everyone because I'm basically the, the memory of Westeros. Um, and that sounds like plot armor to me, but it also sounds like that could that could be like a fake plot armor to make people think like, oh, Bran can't die or Bran has to die. Because um, like I'm, I threw it out to you guys. I'm like, I wonder if Bran or the Three-Eye Raven is the magic that is keeping the Night King alive, that maybe the Night King wants to kill Bran so that way he himself can die. I don't know. Um, that was just something I thought to myself. I've seen that in shows or, or movies before where a character is linked to another character and he can't die until the other one dies. Like Harry Potter and Voldemort, like, you know? Except neither of them wanted to die, but Harry had to die in order to defeat Voldemort. That's, that's just what I meant by that. <laughs> Um, but, um, I have a friend named Sean, I think I mentioned this last episode, where he has heard of, like, a thought process or a theory that the Night King isn't going to be at Winterfell, and that he is instead going to King's Landing, and, um, we'll talk about it more once we're done with the breakdown, because it's something that, at first I was kind of like, I'm not sure, and... The more I saw this episode and the more I'm thinking about it, I'm like, actually, you know what? I think there's a lot more to that than I let on or I thought about uh, previously. But the War Room basically set them down to say, hey, let's yeah. take out the Night King and we will. We think the, the undead will just stop, essentially. Um, but like all movies and plans, I think this plan is going to go south in some way and mm. manner. And I think that South is going to be the Night King's not going to be there. So that's basically the war room. Is there anything else you want to add? Not really. You hit on some really key points. So mm -hmm. Perfect. So we'll go ahead and jump to John on the wall with the three uh, white knights. No, uh, Night Watch? Yeah, Night's Watch. I kept wanting to say Nerd Watch, and I'm like, that's not right. That's us. Um, but we get to see a nice little reunion of Sam, John, and the Lord Commander now. Um, talking it over about just, it, it's kind of like a parallel to them mm -hmm. whenever they're on the wall. And uh, it was cool because he, um, the one dude even said, like, now my watch begins. Um, kind of symbolizing, like, hey, you know, we're doing it again. We're, we're back mm -hmm. here. Just the wall is no longer the big wall in the north. It's our home. It's the wall to our home. And it, it was a very, like, basic scene. Nothing really big. It was just John and them kind of talking things through it. It was very basic. <laughs> Nothing huge. I just really wanted to point that out. Um, it was a nice scene because you got to see them all talking and, and joking about it. And basically, John and Sam got to laugh at the other because it's like, yeah, we've been with women. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> um, but the scene was cool. I don't know if you have anything to say about that scene or anything caught your eye there or if you want to continue on no it was pretty basic it wasn't anything it was just a good fun little scene that tied in the whole night's watch being in winterfeld and you know my my favorite part is you know he goes to hug him and then torwan comes out of nowhere and he's like ha, -ha! <laughs> oh, <laughs> you yeah. know 
<laughs> kind of breaks up the whole bro hug uh, relationship thing. Yeah, Tormund was great this episode. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, he he really shined a big light on this episode. Which, which that saying, let's move on to the next thing. Yes. Uh, drinking in the hall. So, <laughs> we all know that in the morning, uh, the night... The night has cometh, and it's time to defend. Well, I knew for a fact that one of my, well, my favorite character wasn't going to be getting any sleep, and that's Davos. <laughs> um, we we got to see uh, uh, Jamie and Tyrion. They were first talking about some stuff, and they were like, you know, we're just going to drink. And I like how like Tyrion is always like, well, let's drink. It's not great, but it's okay. Like, I'll drink this wine, even though it tastes <laughs> like butt. And then out of nowhere, Brian of Tarth and uh, Podrick comes in. And he's like, oh, let's drink together. And Brian's like, no, I'm good. And he's like, what about you, Podrick? And Brian's like, no. And he was like, come on. It's just, you know, it's the last, you know, he could die tomorrow. And she's like, okay, half a glass. And that is the best scene ever because Tyrion completely overfills that cup. Yeah, like, and he kind of like <laughs> looks at him like, hey, yeah. Yeah, he's like, thanks, man. <laughs> um, so they start drinking. Uh, Dava shows up and he's like, hey, you know, let's drink together. And then, No, he doesn't course, drink. He came in for the fire. Oh, uh, yeah, he came in to warm himself. Um, but the best part was when Tormod walked in. And he was like, they were talking about, oh, you want something to drink? And he's like, I brought my own. And it's like this big old, like, horn. Yeah, I remember. Viking I, horn. Yeah. Didn't I buy you one of those, if I remember correctly? Or no, did you buy one yourself? I bought a uh, horn, like, just a, a natural, like, uh, horn horn. Oh, <laughs> oh you, uh, you didn't buy a drinking horn. Oh, no. okay. That's right. That's right. Uh, so the the funny part is, is. Um, kind of, we get to see Tormon trying to make his moves on Brian. He's like, look, we might die tomorrow. You know, let's curl up and make love and all this other stuff. And then she kind of looks at Jamie and, and Tormon, I think realizes, holy crap. Like she loves him, <laughs> you know? So oh, yeah, he definitely took it as like a, like a threat to him. He, like, Oh, I have to get through this guy to. Yeah, so he does what wildlings do and do crazy wildling things and tells Jamie, why do you call, why do you think they call me, was it Giant Spain? I think yep. that's what they call him. He says, it's because I met at a giant and slept with his wife. And when I woke up, she thought I was like her, his, her, their son and ended up breastfeeding him and drinking giant's breast milk. So... The it just after that happens, the most funniest scene that I've seen in a while with Tormon is he's chugging this ale and it's just going down his face and all down his shirt and everything, like all this like wildling gear and just drunk, you know. And it looks ridiculous to everyone in the room because they're like, uh, tradition kind of yeah, deal. Yeah, I, I love uh, Brian's face. Like I mentioned before about reactions, that reaction shot was probably the best. <laughs> just just her of like utter disgust um but that that scene was also like i i just enjoyed that scene just them kind of sitting there all talking interacting having fun and then something big happens i don't know if you want to talk about oh uh, no why don't you go ahead let's let's get you to get in a little bit of this great action that happens <laughs> all right so basically um they start talking and, and it's like you know sir jamie and then uh, I think it was Tyrion's, like, Sir, uh, well, Sir, um, Sir Brianna Tarth. And she's, like, lady. And Tormund's, like, all confused, and he's, like, what? You can't, you're not a knight? And she's, like, women can't be knights. And Jamie basically turns to her and just, like, no, screw this. You don't need a king to make a knight. You just, mm -hmm. you just are, like, a knight. Um, like you only, uh, a knight can make another knight. That's what it was. And they go and they, they knight, uh, Brienne. And this was the scene that personally, like for me, got me choked up the most just mm. because the look on Brienne's face 
when she stands up and they all start clapping, she has the look of like someone who just got what they wanted since childhood. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I just want to add there for a second is if you know Brienne of Tarth and like her character and how far she's had to sling through crap and live through all that crap. And she's done so much good stuff. Like one, she, she was, um, right hand to a king and witnessed him being murdered by a shadow figure and she fled and protected uh caitlin's catlin stark for a long time and then ended up you know guiding jamie through some crazy stuff and she even fought a bear with a wooden sword a little bit <laughs> and you know she she had to deal with podrick you know, made him the man who he is. Brienne of Tarth deserved this. And that's why it's so beautiful. Like when she was knighted, I felt that. I felt this person went through so much. And around that time period, women were looked down upon like that. You know, like women in that era. This is a fantasy show. But, <laughs> you know, it, it was a it was a very strong scene, and I I loved it because it's exactly what we wanted for Brienne was Brienne. I want Brienne to be respected as a woman, of you know a knight. You know yeah. she 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 literally is a knight. She took on the hound and beat the hound. She beat the crap out of hound. You know so she's good in my book. <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say. Yeah. So and. I, I definitely agree, and I think that's one of the reasons why I choked up so hard, because mm. she was, if, of all the characters who deserve, like, good things, she's mm. one of them. Um, unfortunately, like, we also mentioned that yep. basically everyone in this drinking hall has some form of character, like, resolution, mm -hmm. um, which basically makes me fear for them, because it's like, everyone in here can die, and it mm. would be story progression, like, correct in the storyline session so mm. that makes me worried i still have the one that either jamie or brian is going to be azora hyde that's more of what i want i i see more john being azora hyde mm. than that but that's that's for another time i'm not even going so. to try to talk about azora high all that much because i could sit here and explain how each one could be and, and all that good stuff so let's move on yeah. to the person that I think is Azor Hyde, <laughs> which is the Hound, um, mm -hmm. uh, or if you guys know him in Hot Fuzz, is Yerp. Yerp. Uh, <laughs> Yerp. <laughs> I, I thought it was so funny. A lot of people, a lot of my friends, didn't know that was Yerp from Hot Fuzz. Uh, if you haven't watched Hot Fuzz, it's Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, it's a great movie. You need to go watch it, uh, and then you'll know what Yerp is. Um, so. The hound is chilling up on the, you know, kind of up on the Winterfell wall, just drinking, thinking about things. And this is, I have to say, one of the best story driven characteristic thing for the hound. Because who shows up to drink with him? Arya Stark um, shows up and I forget the other person, the other guy that's part of the Knights, uh, the brotherhoods without Bar banners. Don Darian. I, I hope I say that right. Da Darian, the one that's been Dar killed like 16 Bar times. Bar yeah. 16 times. Bar yeah. So the key point I want to make here is it's a simple, just them talking. And the key point I want to hit is Arya tells the hound when, how you know she's just shocked that the hound she goes when's the last time you ever thought of someone without fighting for your own self and you know she was shocked that he's even here helping like he even says like he's like you know i'm here like i'm going to defend for the living and she's kind of like what like what happened to you <laughs> you know kind of deal and she realizes, you know, and, and I think my favorite one is, is when he comes up to join them to drink, he looks at her and says, is he on your list? And she goes for a little while he was. And he's like, ah, dang, because <laughs> you know, he doesn't really like him. Um, but it was a good interaction scene. Um, I liked it a lot, but what that scene was, was it was just a little scene between the hound and her 
And, uh, oh, yeah, one other thing we forgot to touch base on was Gendry finally made Arya's weapon. So, and we got to see oh, some pretty cool Arya school. Oh, he got to make more school. than just Arya's weapon. You know yeah. what I'm saying there. So, oh. that brings me into my other thing is Arya kind of became the dominant woman. And Podrick kind of like showed up and was like, hey, hey, what's up? Here's your weapon. Yeah. You and said she, Podrick, you meant you I mean, mean Gendry. <laughs> I mean Gendry, sorry. <laughs> Both of them are good with the ladies. Uh, <laughs> so, also, with, with that being said, we actually found out, you brought that up, we actually found out why Podrick. <laughs> well, the, it's a possible, like, I, the, it's not confirmed, but the reason why Podrick is loved by the ladies is he has a beautiful singing voice and he mm-hmm. swoos them. I don't know if that's true or not, but... So, yeah, moving forward. So, Gentry and Arya kind of bow chicka wow wow on some some things of grain. And uh, she becomes very dominant during it. She's like, take your pants off. But the key scene that I want to bring up is the, the thing that you brought up, which we both kind of knew that was coming, was she took off her shirt. We didn't get to really see it. And I just want to state this for the people. I don't know if you know this, but have you looked up the internet searches for the last day? Nope. So, so many people are feeling guilty (laughs) about what they just saw. Uh, Macy Williams that, and I just want to say this, it was a body double. You can tell that that person is a body double. Um, Macy Williams doesn't even look like that body. Um, But, a lot, no. a lot of people are searching how old she is because they oh, feel. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did hear about that. They're all like concerned. It's like, well, did they just show like a a fourteen year old? It's like, no, dude, she's like twenty two or something like that. Yeah, she's she's a lot older now. If this was like four seasons ago, yeah, you should be concerned. Um, but it's it's still kind of weird if you think about it. You know, like yeah. you technically saw her as a child, and then like yeah. It's a body double. They did that yeah. properly. They they shouldn't probably have her. Well, they did the thing, same same thing for Cersei. Cersei was body, you know, had a body double. Um, well, they they also had to do that because she has tattoos galore. Yeah. So after the whole bow chicka wow wow thing with Artie and Gentry, let's move on to uh, the next thing that is a huge huge reaction point, and that is. Daenerys and John in the crypts of Winterfell. So Josiah, why don't you go ahead and explain to the viewers what really happened? Well, I mean, it's it's pretty base in stone. Uh, Danny comes down to the crypts, sees John in front of Lyanna's statue, and she's like, "Who's this?" And he's like, "Lyanna Stark." And she's like, "Oh, you know, I never understood. People always talk such great things about my brother Rhaegar." And but you know he kidnapped her and raped her and I never understood why and then John basically like he didn't kidnap and rape her, they loved each other they were married, they had a kid, and when she died she gave the son over to her brother to foster as her own. And that son is me. And she's like what? And she got down down down. She gets all like kind of caught up and she was like. She's definitely in denial, and she's definitely looking at it as a claim to the throne versus, like, him being, like, I found out who my parents are type deal thing. And she's like, oh, it just so happens that your best friend told you this and your brother confirms it. Like, that sounds like you're just trying to, to make up something. Um, and John's like, no, you, you know it's true. Like, you, 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 you know too. And so it, it basically, it, it, it's just, like, drama to fill in between them to cause dissension. But I think this is the perfect opportunity to unite the king, like the the world. Because you have the North not wanting to bend to a new ruler outside of the North. And you have this queen who now has a, a legitimate like person she could marry and continue the Targaryen dynasty as it once was. Um, the only negative is, is we don't know if those two are keen on cousins to cousin Bow Chicka Wow Wow or not. Who knows? <laughs> um, but I think that's where it will probably lead to, or they won't have that opportunity because they'll all die. Um, but that's basically what happened there. And that's honestly the last of the things that happened with the end coming 
with horns blasting as we see the dead army arriving at Mm -hmm. midnight at Winterfell. And that's where the episode ends. But I do want to make a note about the end that was kind of like pointed out. Like I I saw and I when I was rewatching and thought about like, huh? Yeah. So the Night King is riding the dragon. You don't see the Night King on any of the horses. So not there. And you don't hear like a cry of a dragon at the end of that scene. So Mm -hmm. he doesn't seem to be there. And so I. I think there is some validity that my, my what, what my friend kind of talked about that the Night King has gone south to King's Landing to destroy and kill it. And what I think mm-hmm. is going to happen in the next episode is it's going to be half of it is them fighting and then realizing that the Night King isn't there and mm-hmm. them basically get told like, hey, we can't kill these guys, but if you guys can kill the Night King, um we could possibly, like, they could possibly stop. So we will hold out as long as we can. Daenerys, Jon, you guys take the dragons and you fly to the Night King and you kill him. And then it's going to be like a, a, the, what what is that terminology in story writing? The uh, clicking, ticking talk, ticking clock. That's it. And they're going to have to race to uh, King's Landing, which will be destroyed by... The Night King, and he'll be like in the Red Keep or whatever, and it'll be an epic dragon battle uh, over uh, King's Landing with a fight against John Daenerys. And like I, I've I've told people multiple times, if John is um, Azor Hyde, Danny will be like dying or whatever, or almost dead, and he'll like stab Danny to keep her from becoming a white, and he'll pull out Lightbringer, and then he'll kill the Night King. Um, stopping them and saving. And then I think what would really make it tragic is if after he defeats the Night King, he flies back to Winterfell only to discover everyone dead at Winterfell. That would be like the greatest, like, bitter, bitter thing ever, you know? Like, he, he does it. But that's that's just something that I came up with in the last 24 hours, I'd say, since the episode premiered um, mm. of things that could be. But Austin... What what are yours predictions? You can say like this is a wild prediction, a very simple prediction. Um, um yeah, what do you think? I'm going to stick to what I've been thinking. And you know, y- even you thinking this actually confirms it in a way. Um you know, let's talk about the House of the Undying and where Daenerys has a has a little dream. Uh, per se, well, a vision that the House of the Undying shows where it shows the the throne room in Seven Kingdoms and it's snowing and other people don't realize this. They just think, oh, it's Jon Snow. Uh, But if you look at the rest of the, the room, it's been destroyed. So what my theory has always been is the Night King will sit upon the throne and he will become who he is, but this is actually a really cool theory because uh, I've never heard this theory and I'm really happy about it because you are correct. The previews that we have seen or the ending of the episode, we have not seen the Night King at all. Uh, So this would be an opportunity, but also too is I think that, you know, you don't think it's um, a good thing kind of leading towards this, but the crossbows that are in King's Landing, for the dragons, uh, maybe this is uh, the crossbow that's going to be used to take down the Night King's dragon, which will even the odds. Um, but, you know, that it, it would make sense. It would make sense that he would go for that, um, you know, and then probably head north way. But I actually think that the Night King will, you know, be destroyed this up. You know, I think, you know, if unless your theory that your buddy came up with or the theory that they have is um, correct. You know, we're going to see this wrap up in a couple episodes, Um, you know, because most people think that, you know, uh, there's two theories, you know, one, uh, the Night King takes over Winterfeld, they retreat from Winterfeld, and then they go to the Iron Islands or whatever and defend against them or whatever. 
Um, the other one is they defeat the Night King, and then they go after Cersei, you know, because we have to wrap up things in King's Landing. And also, too, is, you know, some things that we think that's going to happen, like I believe that the Hound will kill the Mountain, uh, because there's always, that you know, what I've always remember from Game of Thrones is when uh, the Hound said, someone's been coming for you, and you know who that person is, says it right to the mountain, and, you know, it kind of states that the, in, in my opinion, that the Hound is going to be killing the mountain, but we also have to say, you know, there's a lot of other things that are happening, we have the fleet of the Greyjoys, uh, their ships, and uh, I forget the other army, it's like the gold, whatever, um, you know a little bit more about the other army that's helping Cersei's. Um, but overall, I think the people that I see dying here soon, the predictions are uh, Brienne of Tarth, uh, Podrick is another one. I think a lot of people in the, th in the, the, the room together drinking was, you know, resolution written all over it. And we are setting up for major, uh, Azora High, you know, and we don't know who that person is. I believe it's the Hound. Uh, a lot of people think now it's Theon Greyjoy because Redemption, born of salt, which he's from the Salt Islands. So, you know, what never, uh, what dies never dies again. I forget what they're saying is. Uh, but yeah, that's my prediction. I see this next episode being a pretty cool epic battle. And hopefully what I think it is, is the Night King will come after Bran Stark. John will kill the Night King and have to replace the Night King and Jon Snow will be the Night King but that's my theory I'm sticking to it so what about you is that all you got pretty much your theory on well, stuff I mean I've had the same theory about Jon becoming the new Night King because the more like the series continues there's certain phrases that kind of stick in my brain and the one is what uh I can't think of his name the dude who took over the Night's Watch after he killed Jon um he, he turned to him and said, like, you know, now you'll have to deal with their problems forever. Um, and I can't help but think about that anytime I think of John. And so I'm like, maybe he will become the Night King. And how he solves people's problems is by taking the dead across the north again and just basically keeping them up there. And he has to just stay up north the whole, for, for the rest of eternity to keep winter at bay always. Um, or maybe he can't die because he, like how he was resurrected, he doesn't grow old and he just is there infinitely. I don't know. Um, there, there's, there's a level of like predictions I want to make, but there's also a level of, I'm at the point where I'm like, the show will not satisfy me. Um, mm -hmm. and that's just because. You know, with, with all this stuff, I feel like they could have turned this last season or even the season before that into two seasons by themselves um, like they yeah. did before. But they're unfortunately on contract for only so many seasons. And that, to me, like I feel like it kind of gyps the possibility of the story and, and it wrapping up epically or correctly. Um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm going to watch the series and what's going to come out. Um, in belief and hopes, knowing that whatever this ends is how it's going to end in the books. But I'm more concerned about the character resolutions in the book, like Lady Stoneheart and um, mm. Aegon, the Aegon Targaryen, the, the one from the other book that proclaims to be Aegon. Is he really Aegon? Is he not? Um, all that stuff. Mm. Like, just in general, like those characters, I know that, like, Ger Martin and his, like, kind of group of writers who are writing the books uh they'll do justice to it even if other people may not like it how long he's taking i know he's taking time because he cares about the books and that's why i'm waiting well, for I'll, oh go ahead sorry no, no no that that was basically it all right so i'm just gonna state this this is something that i want to you know it was probably be taken out of context but i believe it's really hard to satisfy a nerd uh, what I mean by that is, let's take, for example, um, Star Wars. 
you know, the, you know, that supposedly this is going to be the end of the Luke Skywalker's trilogy. I think it's going to be really hard to satisfy nerds. And it's always been really hard to satisfy nerds. Um, you know, we, we have Endgame coming out this week for the Avengers. And I don't know how, you know, it's going to be. Maybe it will satisfy. But it's really hard to do that to people that are so invested into something that you give them the correct ending to help. I remember when The Sopranos, which is HBO's other thing, where a lot of people were very upset with how it ended. But in reality, a lot, as time went on, people started loving the ending. Um, so with everything that's going on, I feel sometimes I'm like, I hope this just doesn't end so bad that it ruins the whole series for everyone. Because you don't want that to happen because you get a show that's like, oh, well, you know, this is a really good series. And they watch it and you're like, wow, this really kind of ruined it. Um, <laughs> but I don't think they'll do that. I, I, I believe that HBO, those guys know what they're doing. And George R. Martin kind of has told them how the ending is going to work. So we'll see how that goes. You know, there, there's been some really good shows that have great endings. Breaking Bad is one of those, for example. So... You know, uh, we'll keep moving forward. And I'm excited for next week's episode. I can't wait. This is going to be an hour and a half long episode. It reminds me of the old Walking Dead episodes where they were an hour and a half. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is such a good episode. But we're going to see. I think we're going to see a lot this episode because we only have uh, four episodes left, yep. you know, and, and it's going to be perfect. I think. We're going to have so much fun because I think, you know, always a season always takes forever. But what I've always known about Game of Thrones is Game of Thrones likes to wrap up things before the end of the season. Uh, the Red Wedding, for example, is two episodes before the season finale. You know, so remember that. Remember that. Because I thought when I watched the first time that the Red Wedding was the season finale, which I was wrong, uh, and uh, what was it? The other one where uh, Martell fights the mountain. That was two episodes before because the season finale is when Tyrion escapes and murders Tywin. So don't expect us to be like, oh, we got to wait. It's going to be this big action pack, you know, ending. I think what's going to happen is we're going to see everything unfold in the next two episodes. So and then the next two episodes after that will be just you know, setting up, you know, well, in the next three episodes and then the last episode will be like an epilogue. Yeah. So I feel that I'm confident. I'm excited. I am super excited. I, you know, and I respect a show that knows when it's stayed, it's welcome and it's at its prime, you know, Game of Thrones. When I remember when it first came out, only had 5 million people watching it. Uh, last season, 52 million people tuned in to that last season. So I'm super excited. It's something that you can talk to your coworkers about. Um, for example, my uh, the guy that owns the company I work for, his son came up and was like, "You a Game of Thrones fan?" And I was like, "Uh, <laughs> of course I am." You know. So it it what I love about Game of Thrones, and and I hope that it it lives up to its standards because it will get us to talk about what happened for the next five years. Yeah. And it will lead into better things like, uh, you know, some of these series that they're doing spinoffs on. So, but that's all I'm going to say because I'm ranting on. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, I think we wanted to do some death predictions, but we kind of already covered that throughout the uh, mm -hmm. episode, just us talking in general about the resolutions and who we all think. So, I, let's make this really, really short. Austin, who is your number one person you think will die next episode, and what percent do you think they'll die by? I think the next person that's going to die is Grey Worm. Grey Worm? And okay. I think that's a 90% chance because the trailer that we see, Grey Worm, is on the front line. Yeah. And Grey Worm has been interacting lately kind of, you know, a little weird. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know the scenes that we saw where he was with uh, trying to interact with those kids, you know, um, you know, and I've been watching some of the Game Grumps. I watched a Game Grumps today where he was on, and he is the actor is freaking hilarious. I love the so, dude. He's hilarious. As yeah, true. he's he's really good. I was really happy. But back to what that is is I think this is a good 
time for Grey Worm to die. Grey Worm is an honorable man. He wants to die in battle. You know that because he's an Unsullied. And I think this shows character because the trailer that we've seen is him putting on the helmet. And he's like, Ugh, you know, ready to go. And I can't wait to see Grey Worm do his thing. But I think Grey Worm's going to die. That's my... That's ninety percent prediction. That's I, I think you're you're pretty spot on right there. Um, mm. Of all the characters, like A and B and C ranks, I think we're gonna lose a lot of C rank characters, like you know, Barrack Dondarian, uh, Grey Worm. Um, I could even see like some of the more popular C rank characters, like Podrick and all of them, kind of taking the fall. I think mm. you're pretty on spot on with the uh, Grey Worm. Um, I love Grey Worm. I love his character. Um, but he is, like you say, a frontline fighter. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, that's why I also thought of Tormund last season. And, hey, he survived. Not last season. Maybe the season before that. The Battle of the Bastards. I thought he was going to die there. Two, two seasons ago. Yeah. yeah two seasons I thought ago. he was going to die there. And he survived because Tormund's a freaking monster. But yeah, I'm afraid because you know. Tormund's one of my favorite characters. And... If he dies, like, they die. Like, it's at the point now where I'm like, they survived to the end of the series. That's all you can hope for when you have a favorite character. And I, I kind of agree with you. I think Grey Worm is on the chopping block pretty high up. Um, mm -hmm. It's sad to say, but it's the truth. Hopefully he's in another series soon. Um, if he is, if he does have the chopping block, if he does uh, get nicked, I'd love to see him in another series but i also know that he's some type of musician so you can also catch him in other places um well, in anything words, else you want to add austin or are you good to close the curtain on this e podcast all i'm all, all i'm gonna say is for all of us game of thrones fan they've been saying it from season one vala magolas all men must die and we see in this trailer that there's going to be people dying yeah. but Honorable deaths are awesome, and they make for the best television, and I think Grey Worm's going to show us that his death is awesome. <laughs> I'll just feel sorry for what's-her-face when he goes. Um, I, I just want to know how they made love. <laughs> hey, man, you don't, you don't need that to... You know whatever, what? You know? You, know, you know what? I just want to bring this up. So I'm part of a Game of Thrones fan page on Facebook, and someone's like, oh, is Theon and Sansa going to get it on? And like most of them's like, he doesn't have a penis. And so, of course, I have to comment and be like, well, it didn't stop Grey Worm, did it? And all of them were like, you're right. <laughs> you know, because like, so I'm, you know, Grey Worm's a great character, but I, I, I see it going. I mean, so. I, I hate to say this, like for anyone for um, Sansa to like marry, I think Theon would be the number one. Not for the fact that like, you know, he would like, fall under Sansa but you know I don't think Sansa would want to have kids by a man or something like that I don't know uh, that was whatever let's go ahead she's a very strong and independent yeah, woman let's go ahead and wrap <laughs> this up shall we <laughs> yeah let's wrap her up so as always I am Josiah you can catch me on um, YouTube if you look up Mahler67 you will see my channel I play Pokemon and other games and such if you enjoy my voice and want to see more stuff I do I am also uh Part of the Class and Your Talk crew, uh, I mainly do this podcast with Austin. I'm going to start stream streaming um, here within like a month or so. Uh, so you could also catch me there. Um, Austin, where can they find mm. you? Also, you can find me at facebook.com slash classy nerd talk. That is our Facebook page. And if you're part of like loving to talk about Game of Thrones, uh, but remember not spoilers, mm -hmm. uh, you can actually be part of our community, which is always growing every day. And we are very active every day. I'm approving posts. So um, yeah. you can catch us on there. You can catch us on YouTube and any other format that allows podcasting like Spotify, iTunes, Pod Addict, I think that's what it's called. Uh, and Buzzsprout is our main account. So thank you guys for listening so much. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, until next week where we get to see the epic ending of this bow, we hope you guys have a safe night. And remember, it's dark and full of terrors. Oh.